All right, so next we have Cassidy presenting about depression. We are gonna let her go ahead and start her presentation. Any guests who join us, we do just ask that you please mute your screens and your video during her time so that she has your full attention. Cassidy, take it away. All right, hi, thank you. Um, so my topic was the um, identifying the signs of depression among teenagers and we'll just get into it because it this video already has it. Recorded. Hi, my name is Cassidy Jones and my capstone is identifying the early signs of depression among teenagers. I think that this topic is very important and needs to be taken more seriously. People need to be educated on mental illnesses such as depression because it is so common, especially with everything that's been going on with COVID and the isolation. And it is an illness, granted it may not be physical, but it is mental and it's just okay. uh, the four main types are situational, biological, psychological, and existential. And it can range from minor to severe. And it generally depression just doesn't result from a single event, but from a mix of events and factors. To get into some statistics, about 20% of all teens experience depression before they reach adulthood, 10 to 15% suffer from symptoms at one time only only 30 percent of depressed teens are being treated for it and then one and three adolescents will meet the criteria for an anxiety disorder by the age of 18. and i know anxiety is a separate mental illness from depression but i feel like this is important to put in here because it is such a high number and anxiety does coincide with depression and is people with anxiety are more likely to have depression. So I feel like that's important to add. This ties into what I was stating before about the four major types of depression, except this is a little bit further analyzed. So the causes consist of brain chemistry, hormones, inherited traits, which are biological, early childhood trauma, and learned patterns of negative thinking. So going in order, neurotransmitters are naturally occurring brain chemicals that carry signals to other parts of your brain and body. And when these chemicals are abnormal or impaired, the function of nerve receptors and nerve systems change, which leads to depression. So basically when there's an uh, imbalance of chemicals in the brain, it affects someone's thinking and thoughts. And then next we have hormones, which uh, we'll get into a little bit in the next slide about um, different effects on boys and girls but it changes in the body's balance of hormones may be involved in causing or triggering depression which we'll see in the next slide and then we have inherited traits um, which depression is more common in people who are blood relatives like such as your parent or grandparent and who also have depression so it passes down and then obviously we have early childhood trauma or just trauma in general, which can be from physical, emotional abuse, a loss of a parent, may cause changes in the brain that make a person more susceptible to depression. So that's a big thing because it affects someone's brain and um, the feeling of hopelessness. Um, and then next we have the learned patterns of negative thinking. So teen depression may be linked to learning to feeling helpless so if someone's um if they've been living a negative life if their parents are so negative about things and degrading it will affect them and affect their brain and how they view themselves and the world in general so here are more statistics in the first picture we the graphs of we see teen girls and teen boys who deal with depression and the graph to the left which is the girls the green one is very obviously significant much greater and that is because depression rates are higher in girls and boys because typically girls reach puberty before boys do so they're more likely to develop depression at a younger age than boys but that by no means means that boys not have depression because as I was stating before there are multiple types of depression and causes so this is just the hormonal aspect and a boy can be diagnosed with depression 
for other reasons, and it can be hormonal, but it's just greater chance in girls than boys. And the next picture we have starts with challenges to parent recognition of their child's depression. Um, so the first is hard to tell normal ups and downs from depression. The parents have 40%. Youth is good at hiding feelings, 30%. We don't talk about feelings much, 14%. Don't spend much time with my youth, 7%. And then not sure what signs of depression are, 4%. Um, and the next picture all the way to the right are percentages of teens, 12 to 17, having a major depressive episode. And I think this is important because you can see that ages 16 and 17, which are higher teenage years, are significantly larger than a 12 year old. And that should lead to more cause to reach out and to identify and be aware of teenagers and their mental state. Here's a list of emotional changes someone with depression may have. This can help better identify if you or someone you love has depression and whether or not, whether or not you should reach out. So first off, we have feelings of sadness, which can be just crying for no apparent reason. And then frustration or feelings of anger, even if it's over something small, usually people with depression are on edge and then feeling hopeless or empty, irritable or annoyed, which ties into the frustration, uh, loss of interest in usual activities, which usually a lot of people with depression isolate themselves and um, they don't uh, do as much as they used to or things that they enjoyed. And then there's a loss of interest or conflict with family and friends, which happens a lot because um, Either they isolate themselves or they're always on edge and frustration and getting into fights. And then people with depression have low self-esteem, feelings of worthlessness or guilt, fixation on past failures or exaggerated self-blame and criticism, extreme sensitivity to rejection or failure, and the need for excessive reinsurance. They have trouble thinking, concentrating, making decisions and remembering things because their mind is elsewhere. It's focused on surviving rather than doing the task at hand, which if someone's grades are slipping, that's also a good identifier, but not just the only identifier, there has to be more to that. Um, and then there's ongoing sense that life in the future are grim. And then there are frequent thoughts of death. Next, we have another list of behavioral changes with someone, someone with depression may have. So first off, we have tiredness and loss of energy, which goes into the next one, either sleeping too much or not being able to sleep at all. And then we have changes in appetite. So their appetite can be decreased or increased. A lot of people with depression develop eating disorders due to it. And then there's people who are using alcohol or drugs. They're usually abusing them to um, escape reality. And then there's agitation or restlessness, for example, pacing, hand wringing, or inability to sit still. And then the slow thinking, speaker body movements, that could be because of how tired they are or how their brain is focused on something else. And then there's frequent complaints of unexplained body aches and headaches. So you can identify that if someone's visiting the school nurse a lot. And social isolation, which goes into the um, emotional changes. Poor school performance, which also relates to emotional changes. All of these relate to the emotional changes. It's a, an effect of those. And then there's angry outbursts, less attention to personal hygiene, and then self-harm. That Those are very large identifiers. So here's some risk factors of depression, which may just mean basically inducers, things that may help lead to depression. Um, first off, we have someone having issues that negatively impact self-esteem, such as body dysmorphia, peer problems, long-term bullying, or even academic problems. And then someone who's been the victim or witness of violence 
and that can be physical, sexual, or even our mental abuse. And having other mental conditions, such as bipolar disorder, anxiety, a personality disorder, or an eating disorder, a lot of those coincide together. Uh, having a learning disability, such as, or ADHD, having ongoing pain or chronic physical illness, such as cancer, diabetes, or asthma. Having certain personality traits, which can be low self-esteem or being overly dependent, self-critical, or even or pessimist, pessimistic. Um, abusing alcohol, nicotine, or drugs is a does affect someone's brain, and that can also lead to depression because of the chemicals and the imbalance. Um, having in the biological aspect, having a parent or a blood relative with a mental health uh, disorders such as depression or bipolar disorder or even a substance abuse alcohol because that can pass down um, chemically. Um, having a family member who's passed away which relates to uh, recent tragic events or stressful life events such as parents getting divorced or a parent in the military and then just having a dysfunctional family can also tie into that and having family conflict. Here's prevention. This is important because if you see someone who's, who may have depression and or you yourself have depression, it's important that you get help. So first off, you take steps to control stress, increase resilience and boost self-esteem to help handle issues when they arise. So having good coping mechanisms um, is very important. Uh, I know many people with depression abuse drugs. If you avoid that and find something that helps you, that's safe and doesn't harm you is important. Um, next, reach out for friendship and social support, especially in times of crisis. And this may be hard for some people with depression because of isolation. But if uh, you have supportive friends who notice it, it's important that you reach out to them. It, and um, next we get, get treatment at the earliest sign of a problem to prevent depression from worsening. This is very important because as people say, it's like a dark hole that you get trapped, sucked into and it gets harder to get out. And then next is maintain ongoing treatment if recommended, even after symptoms let up uh, to help prevent a relapse of depression symptoms. This is also very important because sometimes, even if, if it's chemical, it's going to be there uh, forever. So, and I know there's medications. So if you have to take a medication to help you, that's important. So you got to make sure you get that treatment. As a student, I know how hard COVID was for others. It was the isolation was probably the biggest and hardest part of it. But with school, um, many students weren't ready and adjusted to the learning environment at home. They're used to learning in school and it did affect many people's grades. And I know a lot of students got into that path and and when it was time to go back, many students decided not to because they were stuck in that path and that place that was what they were used to. And when you're not in a good mental state, that's, you just stick to that. So here are some parents views on COVID and how it affected their children. So three and four parents reported a negative impact on their teens connections to friends. Parents report that 64% of their teens have been texting, while 56% are using social media, 43% 43, 43 online gaming, and 35% talking on the phone every day, or almost every day. A national poll shows that 46% of parents say their teen has shown signs of new or worsening mental health conditions since the beginning of the pandemic. And then Dr. Shotkin, um, a child and adolescent psychiatrist leading educational efforts of the Child Study Center at Children's Hospital 
states that when kids are depressed, we try to engage them so they don't stay in, in and isolate. We call it behavioral activation. And I think this quote was very important because when someone is depressed, you don't want them to isolate and you want them to engage in activity, but this was not an option during the pandemic. So it made things a lot more difficult mentally for many teenagers and people. Some ways to help your teen if they're depressed is relaxing family rules. Um, a poll, it showed that 52% of parents told have tried relaxing family COVID-19 rules to allow for contact with friends. Well, 47% also said they loosened social media restrictions. 81% and 70% both said these helped. And then another thing you can do is talk with an expert, which is always a great idea. And one in four parents said they sought help for their teen and 74% of those said it had a positive effect. And the next, uh, keeping communications open while still giving space is important. One in seven parents reported that their teen was withdrawn from the family and this is due to isolation because that's what they're used to. And as you get more depressed, you become more irritable and you rather not fight with your family. And then next, they, you can encourage better sleeping habits because sleeping is very important and keeping a positive mental state. And one in four parents reported that their teens had a negative change to their sleep patterns. And that also may be due to the phone, which we saw before the statistics show that it went up in the usage of phones. It's apparent that the rise in depression coincides with the rise in the use of technology and social media, especially with this pandemic. We see a lot of people are being diagnosed with depression and I think a lot of it has to do with the isolation and being home not doing anything and being stuck on your phone all day and that's the only means of communication um, I for young teens especially girls social media is detrimental because with that there's an increased social pressure which can increase depression um, girls are, the trends, they're trying to, the things they see are not very realistic. There's Photoshop and everything, and it makes a lot of girls feel insecure, and it degrades them and their mental health. And along with the comments that you can say and the things you can say without seeing them and being face-to-face, -face, a lot of people will say anything. Um, a study found that the rate of depression also aligns with the amount of time spent on social media. In that study, girls who spend six hours or more on social media were significantly more unhappy than those who spend only 30 minutes a day on social media. And then uh, for the boys, it was less noticeable. And that's because girls are so invested in social media and following the trends and doing what others are so they fit in. Um, I think for boys more so, gaming is more of their use of escape from reality instead of social media. In the picture, you can see that they relate social media and excessive use of social media to a drug addiction. And I think that's important because it's an, like a drug addiction. Social media is an unhealthy coping mechanism that people use so they can escape reality and the things in their lives and focus on something else. So I think that it's important to notice that. So a question is, are teens today unprepared for life's challenges? And some experts believe that parents have raised their teens to have unrealistic expectations. They haven't taught them the coping skills they need to survive in chaotic times. And they're just unprepared for life ahead, especially teens in high school who are gonna be going on and starting their own life. They they don't know what that's like. They don't know what it's like besides having a strict schedule, doing their work. And it is challenging for some people and the mental state they need to be in to do so and to survive. And then here are some astonishing statistics that I thought I'd leave you off with. 
leave off with every 100 minutes a teen takes their own life. Suicide is the third leading cause of death for people ages 15 to 24. And female teens develop depression twice as often than males. I think that's important to keep in mind and to, I think more people need to um, look and see and pay more attention to people and their mental states to help them to prevent these statistics from increasing. And then that's it. Yeah, I don't know. All right, Cassidy, thank you so much. You did a wonderful job. Thank you. I don't know if there are any questions. I don't know if anyone's on here or not. Yep, yeah, there's our there are a few people here. Is there are there any questions from the audience? You have one you can unmute and just ask away. <laughs> so um it oh go ahead. Oh, sorry, Ms. Ham. I just had a quick question. Um, first, Cassie, I wanted to say congratulations on your presentation. I really enjoyed that a lot and think you did a fantastic job. Um, I especially appreciate how you tied COVID into it and made it really relevant to today. Um, I found that to be very interesting. Um, my question for you is, um, from your experience at the high school, who do you think parents should look to talk to if they suspect that they're child is suffering from depression like who would you recommend the parents talk to at the high school at the high school um well i think that it's important i because i know they can have accommodations and i know that does help a lot of people so if you talk if parents talk to like the i don't i'm not sure the counselors to like help set that up to make things easier for someone who's dealing with depression i think that'd be really smart Fantastic. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Ms. Spigot, did you have a question or a comment? No, I just want to congratulate Cassie on a job well done. Nice work, Cassie. Thank you. Wonderful work. All right, Cassidy, you are all set. Congratulations. You finished your capstone project and you did a wonderful job. All right, Haley, go ahead. All right. Thank you. Animal abuse. It's possible that the phrase sends shivers down your spine. Who wants to witness a person abusing an animal? That is why animal rescue organizations exist. Unfortunately, some people are unconcerned about abusing animals if it helps them to achieve their goals. The good news is that by learning what animal cruelty is and how you can help, you can contribute to the battle against it. This is a difficult subject to discuss but those who speak out against animal abuse send a powerful statement. Let's talk about what animal abuse and animal rescue looks like, as well as how you can help. Any endeavor to preserve animals from brutality and abuse is referred to as animal rescue. Whether law enforcement or civilian, an animal rescue program identifies animal cruelty, retrieves animals from deplorable situations, and makes every effort to offer those animals a better life. For example, most communities have animal control departments that respond to calls about animal cruelty. They look into crimes and assist in the placement of animals in new homes. Animals that have been abused, neglected, starved, or abandoned are accepted by civilian animal rescue organizations. We're not simply talking about dogs and cats, though they are frequently the focus of animal rescue efforts. Many other animals, such as horses, cows, goats, rabbits, and reptiles need to be rescued. It's easier to rehome some animals than it is to rehome others. Every year, more than 6 million companion animals enter shelters in the United States alone. 1.5 million of them are euthanized, either because they are too ill or injured to help, or because shelters are overwhelmed. Keep in mind that those are only companion animals. Let's take a look at animals who are most in need and how we can assist with animal rescue operations. Sorry. Suffering is a tough topic to quantify. Some animals have statistics available while others do not. However, we must make do with what we have. Animal rescue operations frequently focus on certain species or even breeds of animals. There are several animal rescue organizations dedicated to pit bulls, golden retrievers, labrador retrievers, or other specialized breeds of dogs, for example. 
Animal rescuers have an easier time with dogs, cats, and other small animals, while horses and livestock, for example, are small, larger creatures and require more area. Dogs make up around half the animals that end up in shelters each year. They range in age from puppies to older dogs. Some dogs end up in shelters after being discovered on the side of roads or wandering loose in a neighborhood. Others are given up by people who unintentionally enabled their unwanted dogs to reproduce. Animal rescue encompasses dogs and other creatures who have been neglected or mistreated to some of the most heinous circumstances. They may have sores, ulcers, bruises, protruding ribs, and knotted hair that needs to be shaved off their body. Veterinarians are frequently on hand to animal rescue efforts to treat injuries, diseases, and parasites. The so-called lost causes, on the other hand, are frequently euthanized. One of the most serious issues with dog rescue is that most people visit shelters searching for puppies. They want a fresh start and a cuddly bundle of fur to take home with them. Fortunately, there is a growing understanding of the importance of providing a forever home for elderly dogs who will be much more thankful to the human who can finally give them safety and love. Furthermore, prejudices against specific breeds such as pit bulls and German shepherds result in the euthanization of these animals. People are afraid of getting an aggressive dog, therefore they look for more acceptable breeds. Cats are almost as frequently brought in from the cold by animal rescue organizations as dogs. Kittens and cats are both placed in shelters after being permitted to roam outside the house and becoming separated from the owners. Other reasons for cats being sent to the shelters include their owners not wanting or abusing them. Cats are frequently seen in the houses of animal hoarders. Hundreds or perhaps even thousands of these creatures may need to be placed in shelters and, with any luck, adopted by permanent families. Cats and dogs are relinquished for a variety of reasons, such as restrictions on animal housing, bringing a new baby into the world, seeing someone act aggressively, getting upset with basic pet issues, such as bathroom accidents, and animal abuse, which can also be a factor, especially when cats are ejected from their homes and left without shelter, food, or water. Because they are kept on big tracts of land or in rural locations, neglected, abused, or emaciated horses often go unnoticed. Animal protection officers and concerned citizens are unable to intervene since they are not visible. The main issue with horses is that the individuals often purchase them with the assumption that they will not require much attention. Nothing could be more false. Horses stalling or pastured on their own fences are standing water, for example, can acquire thrush, a fungal condition that can lead to painful absences. Because grass alone is not enough to meet a horse's nutritional needs, the lack of grain and hay has a negative impact on their physical health. You should also keep in mind that horses were domesticated nearly as long ago as dogs. They've been bred to be kept as pets. For emotional fulfillment, they require human interaction. Matted hair, unmanaged sickness, and animal mistreatment are some of the other issues that animal rescue organizations face. Regrettably, the belief that horses must be dominated has persisted over time. Whips, shackles, Hobbles and sharp spurs are used by handlers to subdue these creatures. These open wounds and scars that remain are a source of extra troubles and mistrust. This is the most common type of animal suffering, livestock and poultry, which are mostly kept in factory and farms are subjected to far greater animal cruelty than cats, dogs, and horses. They are born, bred, and slaughtered in order to generate profit for their owners. Animal rescue is required to livestock due to poor living conditions, a lack of opportunity to express natural and instinctive behavior, insufficient food, and absence of veterinary treatment. The animal's needs come second to the operation's profitability on farms dedicated to harvesting animal products. The larger profit margins 
the less they spend on luxuries like food, veterinary care, space, and water. People who believe they know what it takes to take care of cattle as pets might also end up in animal rescue situations. Domesticating livestock as pos is possible, but it requires years of sensitive care and delicate instruction. To tackle the facts of animal abuse, it takes a strong conviction. Working with animal rescue organizations exposes people to a variety of disturbing situations. The alternative to animal rescue, on the other hand, is a world filled with animals who have been abused, neglected, or are dangerous. So that's not going to work. So what's the solution? Consider these facts if you're not sure if you want to be engaged in animal rescue or not. Perhaps you have your own pets, or if you have a child who is reliant on you. What if someone you cared about was harmed or mistreated? It happens every day to billions of animals all around the planet. Much of it can be stopped, but only if individuals step forward and develop solutions to prevent animal abuse. You may have come across a stray dog while walking your dog around the neighborhood or in a park. It's a terrifying situation, especially when you don't have a means to defend yourself. When dogs are abused, they become extremely reactive. When they are abused by one person, they learn their only option is to fight back, and they begin to see all humans as possible threats. Let's be clear. The problem isn't with the dog. It's merely doing what he believes is required to stay alive. People and pets are occasionally bitten by reactive dogs and other animals. They may run in front of cars, harass people inside their homes and businesses, and breed unwanted animals. Earlier, we mentioned factory farming. It's the practice of rearing as many animals for slaughter and sale as possible. In other words, an animal who could have otherwise lived a happy life suffers a torturous existence until it is killed and dismembered. If you eat meat or other animal products, this is how animal these animals frequently wind up on your plate. Clothing, footwear, home decor, soaps, and cosmetic goods all contain animal byproducts. Animal testing can cause agonizing trauma, persistent dread, and other deformities as well as death in some cases. It's simple to deny that animal cruelty and abuse exist. If you have pets, or even if you don't, you can expect them to be treated like royalty. Regrettably, this is far from the case. Assume you're traveling down a country road and come across a herd of horses in a field alongside the road. They're scrawny with lacerations on their flanks and they haven't eaten in a very long time. Here you have two options. Continue driving like you hadn't noticed these horses, or bring out your phone and dial 911. The first leads to more animal mistreatment. The second takes around 10 minutes and may even save the lives of the horses. Animal rescue organizations are unable to reach every stray or neglected animal. Those animals will breed with each other if they are not altered. This results in undesired litters. Overpopulation will persist until we can minimize the number of animals sent to shelters and develop ways to teach people how to treat animals humanely. Attempting to change the DNA of animals from factory farming to designer breeding always results in flaws. For example, the toy dog craze has resulted in animals suffering from chronic discomfort, hip dysplasia, heart difficulties, lung deformities, and other alignments. The purpose of agriculture is to generate as much flesh as possible. For example, if a bull weighs 1,200 pounds instead of 1,000 pounds, the farmer receives a higher price for its killing. The farmer is unconcerned with the bull's aching knees, poor conformation, the weakened hip joints. Alternatively, and perhaps more sadly, the farmer may be concerned, but the corporation marketing the beef is not until consumers vote with their wallets and refuse to pay for animal pay. 
Preparing for the worst might sometimes assist us in recognizing animal cruelty and effectively responding to it. There are many different sorts of animal abuse and they aren't always easy to spot. Slaughterhouses specialize in slaughtering animals for the purpose of obtaining meats, organs, pelts, and other animal parts, as its name implies. For example, a cattle rancher can outsource his slaughtering needs to such a company. Slaughterhouses use a variety of procedures. We won't go into much detail, but suffice to say it's not a pleasant environment. It's important to remember that a slaughterhouse is a business. The more, profit, the more profit the company makes, the more successful it is. Slaughterhouses are increasingly being owned by huge meat firms with a focus on efficiency in the United States. The plight of animals is the last thing on their minds. As a result, slaughterhouses use the most cost-effective method for proceeding animals rather than the most humane method. And what exactly does humane slaughter imply? There is no humane mean of killing someone who refuses to die. Every single murdered animal struggled for their lives. You contribute to the profanity of the slaughterhouses by purchasing meats and other animal products. That, by definition, came from them. Animal testing. Before consumer products, pharmaceuticals, and other items are tested on humans, scientists utilize a variety of animals to test them. That may sound like a positive thing for people, but it's a form of agony for animals in their laboratories. Many people, including celebrities, have pledged not to buy products that are tested on animals. That's a fantastic approach to raise awareness about animal rescue. Keep in mind that your money is a is your vote. Lab animals aren't merely infected with disease or have allergic reactions to cosmetics. They're kept in cramped cages with no access to sunlight or fresh air, and they're not provided the love and attention that all social creatures desire. Hunting and fishing. Catch and release fishing is something that many hunters and anglers take pride in. They bring the fish back to the shore or the boat, unhook the lure, snap a few shots for Instagram, and then toss the fish back. But then what happens to the fish? Fishing, by definition, is removing an animal from its native habitat and depriving it of the oxygen it requires, even if only for a short time. Now, it now has a big wound in its lip as well. According to research, the procedure frequently results in fishes suffering from trauma that impairs their in that impairs their ability to eat and swim. They've been permanently harmed. Hunting is frequently promoted as a bounding activity. The issue with that is it results in an animal's death. Not only does hunting need the death of an animal, but animals do not die immediately. After a bullet or bow pierces their hide, they are left to bleed out, and some hunters pursue this target for kilometers before they succumb to their injuries. Hunting and fishing in large groups are neither more ethical nor more environmentally, environmentally friendly. Torture. Isn't torture a dreadful word? It may conjure up images, images of horror films and military interrogation techniques. Torture, on the other hand, frequently kills animals. Take animal fights, for example. Dogs, roosters, monkeys, and other creatures are frequently forced to fight or perish. Only one animal survives and lives with major or even life-threatening injuries. Consider the canine companion who lies at the foot of your bed. Can you imagine him or her fighting another creature like that? Beatings, exposure to severe temperatures, and even more heinous acts are examples of torture. You may help to stop animal cruelty by speaking out against it. Starvation. Some animals go hungry because their owners can't afford to feed them. Others go without food as a form of punishment or because the owner wants them to be submissive. 
in both this in both the short and long term starvation and animal causes substantial harm malnutrition hunger discomfort incapa incapacity to defend dehydration and sickness vulnerability are just a few of the possible consequences puppy mills a puppy mill is a breeding operation that produces a large number of puppies in a short amount of time. Puppy Dogs aren't properly cared for and the puppies aren't given any medical attention. Puppy mills, like slaughterhouses, industrial farms, and other, um, and other comparable businesses, operate solely for profit. Breeding requirements and bonding may not be important to them. They only care about having as many possible as many puppies as possible. Except while they're producing, the female dogs are frequently mistreated and confined to small places. This could also be malnourished. They could also be malnourished, resulting in unnourished puppies. People who purchase puppies from puppy mills are frequently unaware of the potential difficulties until after they've made their purchase. Training methods that are cruel. You may establish trust while training a dog, cat, horse, goat, pig, or any other animal. The human-animal bond makes or ruins the training process. Unfortunately, some animal trainers are unconcerned about the bonding or ethical treatment, preferring instead to attain a desired result as quickly as possible. They are still outdated and cruel teaching methods used in, today, in use today. If you have a pet or animal, make sure you work with a trainer who employs a positive training method that does not include pain, fear, or unreasonable expectations. We've given you enough to consider. You may now understand why animal rescue is such a vital endeavor for everyone who cares about animals. What can you do to help? There are numerous things you can do to put an end to animal cruelty and abuse many of which do not require much work on your part. Let's have a look at, at the most effective ways to assist with animal rescue. Adopt a pet. Consider adopting an animal if you love animals and have space in your home. As previously said, there are millions of animals in need of homes and bringing even one into your life will not only save one of those animals, but also bring immense joy to your family. Dogs, cats, and horses are bred as companion animals for humans. They enjoy learning and are capable of expressing thanks and assist whole families all around the world. In the majority of circumstances, you can adopt a pet from any local animal shelter or group. You'll have to fill out some paperwork, but you'll get a new best buddy in the end. You'll not only save your chosen pet, but you'll also free up space in the shelter for another animal in critical need of help. Volunteer at an animal shelter in your area. Perhaps you adore animals, but your living circumstances prevent you from adopting one. Instead of taking a pet in your home, volunteer at a local animal shelter. Many of these animal rescue groups require assistance with intake, cleaning, animal exercise, and other tasks. Some have gift stores that need to be staffed, while others require dog walkers or assistance in introducing new families to pets. Make a donation to a reputable, reputable animal rescue organization. If you don't have time to help, consider making a momentary or any kind donation instead. Money supplies and other gifts are needed nearly needed by nearly all animal shelters in order to continue their valuable job. Animal rescue organizations rely almost entirely on the generosity of strangers. It's even possible to turn it into a practice. Pick and purchase a second bag of dog food at your local shelter every time you go to the pet store. Animals in foster, animals in foster care until they find forever homes. Foster care is an important element of animal rescue. Shelters quickly fill up and foster homes increase each shelter's capacity, reducing the number of animals that must be euthanized. 
If you don't want to foster an animal for a long time, you don't have to. Consider fo consider fostering a dog or cat for a month, a week, or even a sim or even simply an afternoon. Many shelter programs that allow visitors to take shelter animals out for the day or out for a day of walking or other activities. Increase the visibility of information about animals in shelters. The act of rescuing an animal rescue the act of rescuing an animal might be as simply as pressing a button. To find out arriving pets, go to websites of your local animal shelters, share the content of those websites with your Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram networks. Perhaps you don't have space in your home for, for more pets, but someone you know wants to bring home a new furry family member. You may be able to assist that new family by providing animal rescue information. Avoid animal products. Slaughterhouses rely on the sale to stay afloat. You can prevent those groups by mistreating and harming animals who might otherwise have had healthy lives if you don't buy animal products. It's not just about meat. It will also assist you it will also assist if you refuse to buy eggs, dairy, leather, wool, hides, and other animal products. When it comes to consumer products, there are many synthetic alternatives available, and you don't need meat to survive. Veganism or vegetarianism can be a healthier and more sustainable life choice style. Veganism is the best solution. You are also speaking out against brutality of both dairy, egg, and farming by becoming a vegan. When you see an animal, when you see animal abuse, report it. When it comes to animal rescue, it's sometimes as special as simple as speaking up. Report animal cruelty such as abuse or neglect to the authorities if you believe you have witnessed it. Animal abuse it can usually be reported anonymously. It only takes a few minutes and if you're mistaken you'll give the authorities a chance to look back into what you've witnessed. Animal rescue necessities that use animal rescue necessities the use of one voice for greater good all across the world. Animal brutality, abuse, neglect, and malnutrition are topics that no one wants to think about. It does, however, occur all over the planet, all over the planet. You don't have to start your own animal rescue organization to make a difference in your community for pets and animals. We've provided a variety of ways for you to give back and save the animals. Intervention is required to create a society where animals have the right and those rights are honored. People break animal protection rules, but we have the power to modify how those laws are enforced. What are your plans on assisting animal rescue? So those aren't all my citations, I just included a few of them. That's um, <laughs> you did a wonderful job, Haley. What was your favorite part of the project? Um, I really loved just going to my mentor, Sarah's farm, and we would, um, and I would just help the, her take care of the animals, and it was just really fun, and it was a great experience. Wonderful. Well, congratulations. You were all done with your capstone. You did a great job. Yay! Thank you so much. All right. Enjoy the rest of your year which is I think a day and then have a wonderful summer okay thank you so much you too bye bye